Continuing with the spindle project, we finished the first part, which was the needle alignment uh, part that fits down the center of the spindle. And that just helps guide needles all the way through the spindle out to a collection box that I'll ultimately make. Uh, there also needs to be made a piece that fits on the end of the spindle that's going to spring load adapt to uh, a 5C collet holder part. But I'm waiting on that until I finish this part. So I... <coughs> I'm totally winging this next part of the design. I haven't pre-designed it. I'm just trying to figure out what I want. So this is a 5C collet block and it's going to hold a emergency collet that will be bored out to the diameter of these needles. There's actually going to be collet block, uh, 5C emergency collets made for a variety of different size needles because they actually have a bunch of different needles they use. But I need something that holds the 5C collet uh, in place. I don't need the alignment pin because that'll just add drag. All its only job is to lightly hold this enough to let it rotate. So that should be very straightforward. Um, I have these wave springs that I'm going to use to preload it. And I've got a bunch of different ones here. And I haven't figured out exactly how I'm going to do this. But one thing I do need is I need to thread the rear portion of this so that I can attach a flange to this that'll be wide enough that will pull this whole assembly back. Uh, basically, we're gonna have a piece here that attaches to this, that threads to the inside of the 5C emergency collet, and then we're gonna have a frame over this that will squeeze these two together to release the 5C collet. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure how I'm pulling that off yet, but I need to, th I need to turn this down so the rear of this is round so that I can thread it. And I might just turn the whole thing around just to take some weight off because it doesn't need to be this heavy. This is a nice ground block, but you know, they're fairly inexpensive. So we're gonna do that. Looking for ways to hold this 5C collet block. It has parallel surfaces. Actually, it has a parallel surface only in the back. <laughs> so I need something to hold this and I've got several ways to do it. One is expanding mandrel, but I have concerns that if I use the expanding mandrel, since this is not round, that it's going to be an interrupted cut for the first bit, that it might try and rotate and maybe damage the mandrel. So that's a thought. Another style would be this expanding 5C holder here. However, the wedge portion of it got destroyed. So I'd have to create a new uh, threaded wedge portion for this guy, which is an option. I think I'm going to go with this solution because I can hold it from one side. This is going to have to be reduced in diameter. Uh, to match the 5C collet blocks parallel section and back here. Hopefully it won't wiggle too much. And it turns out I have another one of these that the bolt is still good. So I'm going to use that one rather than remake it for now. So let's just move along following this approach, see if it works. So I'm holding the 5C expanding collet uh, by the parallel section and back. And it looks like it's half a thousandth out at most. So that's more than plenty, I think. Uh, so next up, we're going to turn this section down here. We need it 1.250 in diameter. All right. That was a faster feed rate than I expected. And it uh, destroyed my carbide. <laughs> Nice. It's a good way to start, I think. That's an expensive lesson. Took the uh, end of this guy right off. The other side's totally blown out. I think I have one good corner left on this guy. And then I can still... Um, these are the corners you normally use, but I have a holder that lets you use this corner that is a uh, chamfering tool. So this insert will still be good for that. But as it stands in this holder, all I've got is this... Uh, corner left. All right, slowed it down, reduced the feed rate. This is a heavily interrupted cut, so a positive rake insert's not ideal. Getting perfect chips off this, if that counts for anything. And a nice finish. Remember I said there was an insert holder that would utilize the other corner of these inserts? 
here it is. Here's an example of it. So it just holds them sideways, and then you get eight, four more corners out of an insert, which is pretty handy. I mean, they put them there. Why not use them, right? Loosen the wedge screw here. Runs right down the middle, the one I had to replace. This is a perfect fit. Almost no wiggle before I tighten it. So I'm just going to push this back and seat it all the way down. Hopefully that'll be on there well good enough for me to uh, remove all these corners. So this is going to be some ugly interrupted cut kind of stuff. I'm not looking for a specific diameter right now to set my starting depth for this next cut. I'm going to find my zero by going to the widest part, which is at the corner here. That'll be my zero. And then the point where I'm looking for is somewhere in the middle here where I just want to clean this up. And that looks like I have to take off 650 thousandths, quite a bit. So why don't we start and see how 30 thousandths go. It's going to be a nasty interrupted cut, so I feel a little uncomfortable. The setup's not super sturdy. I could further support this piece with this bull center on this side, but it would make it kind of hard to get in here uh, with this particular insert. And... Yeah, I'd have to change inserts to reach in there. And the ones I have that'll reach would not be particularly good for an interrupted cut. So we're gonna try it without the support. If we need it, we'll work, we'll work up to it. This is a live bull center here to support large pipes and large diameter objects. Very handy to have. You can get them Taiwanese ones or Chinese ones fairly inexpensively. They probably aren't great, but they do work. Now, hopefully this thing won't cant. I made it fit closely enough and I tightened it down pretty hard. So I guess let's just see, huh? All right, that's 30,000. So let's see how we go. what this material was. I was wondering if it was cast iron because that's common to make tools out of. This is definitely not cast iron. It's turning up a burr on the edge here and the chips of course aren't matching cast iron either. So that's the result of the first pass. I guess uh, we'll just continue. Eventually when I get in deeper I'll be able to push a little more. I'm going to try for a higher feed rate see if uh, I can get away with that. That was hard enough that it slipped in the holder. Okay. Now well, it tells me lighter cuts are lower feed rate, most likely. I switched to a Kenna Metal large radius, large nose radius roughing insert. Uh, the other inserts just weren't holding up at all. So hopefully this one will do better. It seems to be removing material much better. I'm also reducing the depth of cut from 30 thousandths a pass to 25 thousandths. And I'm keeping the feed rate slow because the mounting solution I've got doesn't really work with heavier cuts. It, I actually stalled the part. So after I discovered these were steel, I should have thought more carefully about what they did. And it turns out they're hardened. So they're about Rockwell C20, which is not super hard, but it's hard enough that uh, Got to take it slow. So I'm doing 25 thousandths passes now. It's going to take a while because I got to go in 600 and something thousandths. Once it stops being so interrupted, I, I can probably do a little better, but uh, for now, this is as good as I can get. Maybe from this perspective, you can see sort of what the final diameter is going to look like. You can see right in here where the material reflection is sort of consistent. That's about the final diameter. I thought that was kind of interesting to look at. Once I got where the meat, there was a lot more meat being hit every time I rotated around, this roughing insert didn't get damaged, but it was engaging too much material. It was actually causing my lathe to deflect the cross slide, and it was moving by like 20, 30 thousandths a pass. 
it just was completely not working. I tried much lower speed, didn't work. Much lower feed rate, didn't work. So now I'm going to a positive brake insert and I'm going with a high feed rate, but only 10 thousandths depth of cut a pass. And it seems like that's about all I can do, which means this is gonna take bloody forever. The way I discovered that is I tried this insert here, which is a positive rake aluminum cutting insert, but it's tiny little tip radius, which it did get damaged. But it was able to remove material without causing deflection of the cross slide. So I thought, okay, I need a sharper, cut, essentially a sharper interface where the cutter meets the material or a higher angle, if that probably makes more sense. And I need, le I need to engage less material at a time. So that's where I'm at. 10 passes per 100 thousandths, and I got 600 thousandths total from the beginning. I probably have two or 300 thousandths. I got like 20 passes. This is gonna take forever. I thought about taking this guy over the mill and just milling off the corners flat. It was very tempting. And who knows, it probably would have sped things up, but this is a good learning experience anyways. One of the gazillion 10 thousandths passes. With a pretty high feed rate, well, pretty high. Looks like 9 thousandths of revolution is where we're headed, we're at right now. This method is yielding a much better finish. It looks like I still have a ways to go, uh, but you can see even at a high feed rate, I'm getting a decent finish here. I can feel it with my fingernail just because it's winding like a screw at 9 thousandths of revolution across this. But, uh, it's coming off nice. I'm not rolling over a burr on the edges anymore. It's just really clean cutting. So I'm just going to keep it up. I'll bring you back when I get closer. Now that I'm getting close to round, listen how the change in sound, where it's ringing out here, I can damp it by putting my finger in here. And then when it gets to the supported section, listen to the change. There you go. Okay, so now that we've got this guy cosmetically to the shape I wanted, which was rounded, boy, was that a challenge. That was, that was a lot of time just for cosmetic sake, but uh, I think it's worth it because I think it looks really nice. And we finally figured out how to cut this hard material and get a decent finish without chattering and all kinds of other problems we were having because of the incredible rigidity of this hardened material. So next up, we've this is the rear of the 5C cullet. You can see the straight section there. There's the uh, beveled section in the front. So this rear section, we need to relieve it in, reduce the diameter down to some diameter so I can thread on a flange back here. And the pur purpose of that flange will make more sense later. Um, this is no common diameter, but the beauty is you can make threads of any diameter, which is what I'm going to do. So one thing I do every day when I walk out to my lathe, if, especially if I haven't been out for a few days like it has been this time, before I ever move the cross slide, which is just here off camera, I wipe down the ways to get the dust and dirt that is settled on it uh, while I wasn't using it. Because I always leave a film of oil on it and they tend to seem to magically attract all that sort of stuff. And that way, the first time I move it, it won't embed any of that grid in my wipers or get inside, you know, beneath the cross slide and, uh, <clears throat> and the rest of the, the bed ways here, because we really don't want to, you know, wear out this lathe prematurely considering how expensive it is. So we need to remove just under a hundred thousandths off the diameter of this part. And we're gonna go in about a quarter of an inch. The flange dimensions are not particular at all. They're whatever I want them to be. And I'm just gonna choose something even because it's easier. So first up, I'm gonna set my zero depth by waiting for this cutter to just slightly mark the surface. There it is. So I can back off a thousandth or so or two. All right. So now, first pass, we'll do a five thousandths pass here.
So I haven't got the, uh, the threads deep enough yet for this gauge to, in, to actually go into the threads, but I can set it next to it and it looks like it's right on the money. As you can see, these have a little bit of flat part because these were cut for the thread form appropriately as well, where the top, the peak of the thread, the eighth inch should be removed. They didn't do the bottom side, um, but that's not critical. If these were super sharp, you can see the flat side there when I put it on edge. If these were super sharp, I probably would be able to go into the little groove there, but they're not. All right, next pass. We're gonna see if we can actually uh, do about 20 thousandths because initially you're not removing a lot of material. Later on, you gotta take smaller and smaller cuts. This might be a bit aggressive. If I break the tip of my cutter, I'm gonna be very upset. So right now we're about halfway there. We're currently at 45 thousandths total depth, well, 45 thousandths diametral depth. Remember we need to go to 86. So I didn't do my relief deep enough. Like a knucklehead, I went in radially again. Only 50 thousandths. I need to go in 100 thousandths because it's 86. So every time I'm hitting, getting into the relief zone, I'm actually cutting the relief. I'll have to fix that after, so clean it up. That's 84 thousandths. Now we're gonna go for the last two and then I'll do a spring pass and we'll find out how much uh, deflection there was. Because if there was a lot of deflection, then the spring pass will remove a lot of material. There's 86 thousandths right now. Last two thousandths. Okay. And we'll do it again. Same depth. There we go. There's the finished threads. I think they turned out pretty good. The lead in's a little sharp here. I'm gonna have to deburr that. But other than that, I'm uh, very pleased with it. You can see I filed off the top. I guess I approximated eighth inch of the thread. Uh, because the cutter I'm using does full depth threads anyways, uh, the other baiting part shouldn't have a problem, but you really don't want all that extra contact area that doesn't provide much strength anyways. Uh, okay, let's make the flange for this part. We have a chunk of stainless here, and this is what we're going to make the flange out of, and we need about 300 thousandths. It's kind of a lot easier in the hard material, that's for sure. All right, so hopefully this will make clear what I was trying to explain earlier, which is these threads are 1.6520 threads. So the outside diameter, if I hadn't removed the top eighth of the thread, would have been 1.65 inches. Now that needs to mate with this part. If I made this 1.65 inches and then cut my threads, the threads would just wouldn't even touch this outside or just barely brush the outside of these threads and that wouldn't work. I actually need to make this inside diameter smaller by the depth of these threads, which is 0.86 diametrally. So my new thread, my hole size my, that I need to bore here is 1.564. And hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> All right, so next we're gonna bore out the center of this. So I took another light skim pass and it turns out, yes, the insert was damaged. Uh, too big, 50,000 passes were too much for this insert. 
Uh, it's a it's a negative rake holder, but a positive rake insert, so it's got a fairly delicate edge on it. So another thing is, now, the threads you're seeing here are the ones that are going to penetrate to the bottom of these threads. And again, these could have the top eighth removed. So uh, you could make this one eighth of the thread depth times two uh, larger diameter so you wouldn't have to do the equivalent of filing off the inside. So when I took a little bit more material off here, it's not going to be any problem at all. We're going to cut some thread relief here in the back. Boy, left a nasty burst. Stainless Sir is gooey. And the fact that it was chattering when I did that chamfer was not helping at all. So we're going to do some back relief here. We're going to go into uh, 300 thousandths. I don't know if you can see this, but I put in a substantial back relief there for the thread stand up. So even going slowly, I really don't want to crash the thread cutting tool because that'll suck. So. So here's the second part of this guy done. This is a 5C collet holder. And this flange will thread onto this guy on the outside. I did grind this if you want to see the finish here. Just to make sure it's flat and smooth. Okay, ultimately this will get Loctited on. So here's the 5C collet in it, so maybe you're starting to get an idea of what's going to happen. All right, so the way this is going to work, over here is the spin, over here is the spindle side, right? And so there's going to be a piece that threads into this 5C collet. There'll be a spring here and another flange on the piece that mounts to the uh, head collet. And you'll squeeze these two pieces together and that'll push this 5C collet forward. And there's an emergency collet because I have to make it for these very specific needle sizes, which are like 2.1 millimeter, 2.3 millimeter. So uh, right now there's a little, there's a little bit of stiction here. So we'll have to overcome that with the spring. So we'll see how that works out. Boy, I got my measurements pretty darn close there, didn't I? Uh, that fits nice and perfectly. So there's the next step done.